and take it away. Okay, I'd like to welcome you across the United States, the uh, Zoom country, all the way from this good afternoon in the East Coast. Uh, happy noon time at the uh, middle of the United States and uh, a good morning to you here on the West Coast. We're thankful that you're with us for another segment of the National Association of Scholars, Great American Novels. And this is a wonderful sort of series. Now, what they haven't told you in the advance uh, notice is they saved the four superstars for this time. <laughs> so so uh, uh, maybe that's enough on that, but we'll go on and let me give you what we'll be doing so you can follow what's going to be happening here. In a moment, I will introduce uh, sequentially the three people that will be giving information, but I'd like for you to know about some other possibilities. Each of the speakers will be speaking about 12 to 14 minutes. And then when they have finished, we will open it up for questions. And if you notice at the bottom of your screen, there is a little box that, that says Q&A, and you can send in your questions and uh, Maybe, maybe we'll be able to answer everything, the four of us. Uh, and also, if we don't get to your questions, then you can in fact uh, send them to the National Association for Scholars. And let me give you the email address and I'll give it again later on, but here it is, Randall, R-A-N-D-A-L-L -L, at N-A-S dot org. Let me say that to you again, Randall, R-A-N-D-A-L-L, -L, at nas.org. And these uh, conversations will be recorded. So you can plug in later on and uh, hear what we are going to be saying today. Well, this is a good time for us. It's a part of something that's a series. And uh, we'll, we'll address the idea of whether this book, this novel published in 1939 and a winner of the Pulitzer Prize whether it in fact is right at the top of all these great American novels. Okay, let's begin now with the uh, first uh, presenter. The, our first presenter is Robert DeMott, who is the Edwin and Ruth Kennedy Distinguished Professor Emeritus of English at Ohio University. He's internationally recognized as an expert on John Steinbeck and has authored or edited numerous works on Steinbeck. He served as a chief editor for the Library of America's four volume project on Steinbeck. And he serves on the editorial board of the Steinbeck Review. Plus, Professor DeMott has a forthcoming volume this fall, a new book entitled Steinbeck's Imaginarium, Essays on Writing, Fishing, and Other Critical Matters from the University of New Mexico Press. So have at it, Bob. Oh, thank you, Richard. <laughs> Uh, I have to admit, I've never read John Steinbeck, so this is going to be difficult. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, um, I, I, let me start by answering your question. Uh, you know, I taught for American literature for 45 years, and I can say I've taught every great American novel during that period to either undergraduates or graduate students, and I would put The Grapes of Wrath at the absolute top of that, of that heap. I think it's one of the glories of American literary history. Um, and I think it gains uh, enormous uh, prestige and understanding and acceptance as, as time goes by. I think it's, it's probably better mm -hmm. received now than it was in its, in its own time. Uh, and I think it's because to me, it, it's, uh, it defines what a classic book is. And that is, it's not ever, um, uh, um, limited to its own time, its own moment, but that it continually speaks to uh, evolving uh, generations of readers. Uh, it raises questions that um, are somehow prophetic. Uh, Steinbeck certainly did that in terms of climate, in terms of uh, 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 eco economics and social relations and so on. So it speaks to us just as well in our time as it, as it did then. He even, I think he understood that. Um, there's a, a scene in chapter 23 when he talks about 
um, how a work uh, creates participation in its hearers and its audience. And um, I think that's something that he did all through his career, but particularly in The Grapes of Wrath. He said at one point in a letter that the book had five levels of understanding and meaning, and it's, uh, it will be as uh, significant uh, to each reader insofar as what they can bring out of themselves in terms of their reaction to the book. So it's an enormously, uh, it's an enormously cerebral book in the sense that it raises great questions, uh, existential philosophical questions about who we are and what we're doing. But it's also part of its power, I think, or much of its power is based on the fact that it is, um, there's such a level of affect in it. It's emotionally uh, draining, um, it's intense, um, and it sort of carries each reader along in, a, in a, almost a, a, a storm of emotional involvement. So I think these are the reasons that I wanted to, I think I love it so much. I, I, a couple of, last year, there was a, um, there was a little book, not a little book, a very big book that came out from a publisher in France. I don't know if you can see this or not, but it's a, it's a facsimile edition of the manuscript of the Grapes of Wrath, the handwritten manuscript of the Grapes of Wrath. Uh, it was just published, only published in a thousand copies, but it's absolutely wonderful. But if you look at it and read it, uh, it's not very difficult to see here. Steinbeck didn't do any paragraphing um, as we would normally think of, of uh, uh, paragraphing style. He wrote it intensely so that all the paragraphs run together. And then later he would, or during the time he would put in a little paragraph indicator to notice where there would be a break. So his wife, Carol, who was typing it would be able to break it into, into paragraphs. But it's an enormous uh, volume. He wrote over a period of hundred days, 2000 words each, about 2000, 200,000 words long. And it's part of that intensity I think is, comes right out at you as you look at the manuscript of the book itself because it's so focused, it's so uh, torqued down, you know, so to speak. And I think that gave him a sense of energy. It, it propelled his sense of commitment. Um, and uh, it was one of those things that uh, it's really quite remarkable. We, uh, Susan and I had a, a friend, a British scholar named Roy Simmons, who is uh, now departed, but he uh, made a comment once a number of years ago that long before uh, Jack Kerouac developed the concept of automatic writing. Steinbeck was doing the same thing in The Grapes of Wrath. I mean, it's just this one thing, one day after another, everything intensely focused together, and it gave the manuscript a kind of weight and, he and, and uh, heft and legitimacy, I think, that it might not normally have had. Um, uh, beyond that, there, there's so many things you could say about it. I mean, it's uh, as, a, as a lifelong uh, fly fisherman, I'm particularly attuned to the issues of the of climate and environment, and the book has that in, in spades throughout. It also has all kinds of social warnings about uh, what happens when uh, corporate interests, you know, get beyond their uh, beyond their uh, abilities, not abilities, but go beyond their reach, and try to uh, uh, do whatever they can do to keep the populous in shape. Um, the other thing that's always interesting to me is that Steinbeck sometimes left clues in the book as to what he was doing. And there's a little section in chapter 10 where he, he talks about the stereopticon. And uh, there are many kinds of stereopticons or magic lanterns. Um, here's one, I don't know if you can see this or not, but you would look through it uh, and there were slides at the other end, little portraits, and they would be double, double. And if you look through the glass and walk at it intensely, both of those images come together as one. And I thought it was a wonderful kind of artistic uh, trope that Steinbeck uses in The Grapes of Wrath to indicate how he's melding the narrative portion of the Jade, the Joe journey with those intercalary chapters uh, that are um, uh, sort of objective journalism and these two things come together and they, provo they provide a, a, a view of the totality of the grapes of wrath. You know, this is like um, trying to separate those two, those two elements would be like publishing Moby Dick without the cytology chapters. 
which has been done by the way, but it, it just doesn't work. I mean, it, it, it destroys the, the integrity of the whole uh, manuscript of the whole book work. And I think to do that to, to the Grapes of Wrath as was done in some cases where you had expurgated versions of the book is, a, is really a, a disservice to the totality of the impact of the, of the book itself. And Steinbeck um, wrote, kept a journal when he was writing the book, he wrote a journal every single day that he wrote. And he said in the middle, uh, in about the first 20 days or so as he was writing, he started in late May, 1938 and wrote just about every day for a hundred days until uh, into October of that year, uh, 2000 words a day. And about 20 days into the, into the writing, he said I, he, he wished if he could do it right, uh, he wished it would be a truly American book. And I think uh, that w those words truly American book put him in, in conversation with uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin and The Jungle, two kind of rabble rousing books um, that you know, speak to correcting um, injustices in the social fabric. Um, and I think he's done that. I think that was, this is one of the books that we now see year after year after year gets referred to as a, as a major statement about um, the revolutionary capacity of you know, right-minded thinking as opposed to um, imposed uh, sanctions, whatever you, wanna, whatever you wanna call it. So um, beyond that, I'm not sure I can, I can say a lot. It's one of my favorite books, always has been. Uh, and it continues to uh, sell by the thousands uh, every year. It speaks to us in ways I think that a lot of other books don't. Uh, it's just always something um, to cherish, I think. So meets my qualifications for great American novel, I think. Thank you, Bob. Uh, yep. it, amaz it amazes me that Steinbeck told his publisher that 40,000 copies was too much. And by the end of that first year, 400,000 or 500,000. Now, for those of us who are writers now, you can take away a few zeros and we'd still be happy with those <laughs> sales, right? <laughs> okay, our second presenter is Gary Scharnhorst, who was distinguished professor and is distinguished professor emeritus of English at the University of New Mexico. He's the author or editor of over 40 books and he serves as the editor of the journal American Literary Realism and editor in alternate, alternating years of the research annual American Literary Scholarship. Professor Scharnhorst's most notable recent work is a three volume biography of Mark Twain that's getting good reviews. So you're on Gary. Well, thank you, Dick. Um, I'm, I'm sitting uh, in my house, literally uh, a quarter of a mile away from Route 66, the old Route 66 Central Avenue in Albuquerque. Uh, and I must say that I rarely uh, traveled that street or crossed that street without thinking of, uh, of the Okies who took that route uh, to California. Um, I'm going to talk about Steinbeck's uh, use of a, a, a long literary tradition um, of biblical symbolism or biblical typology uh, in which authors recreate uh, biblical events or reenact uh, those events not uh, exclusively Christian symbolism, uh, but biblical symbolism, including, of course, both Hebrew and uh, Christian uh, works. For example, as early as uh, the 17th century, William Bradford, in his History of Plymouth Plantation, compared himself to uh, Moses uh, standing on Mount Pisgah looking out across uh, the promised land. Uh, 
that tradition has over the years reinforced the, the notion of American exceptionalism, which is something may, we may want to get into. Abraham Lincoln, in a, a speech after his first election as president, referred to Americans as an almost chosen people. Nathaniel Hawthorne, in the Scarlet Letter, reenacts uh, the fall of uh, humanity in the garden by depicting um, Hester Prynne as Eve, Arthur Dimsdale as Adam, and Roger Chillingsworth uh, as Satan. James Fenimore Cooper in The Leather Stocking Tales uh, depicts his frontiersman hero, Natty Bumpo, as an American Adam. Uh, and in his uh, novel, The Prairie, uh, features uh, Ishmael Bush, uh, a wanderer. Again, the biblical um, associations uh, go to the point. Herman Melville, even in Moby Dick, the opening line, call me Ishmael, uh, ta taps into that tradition of American biblical typology. And even Stephen Crane in the Red Badge of Courage depicts a, uh, uh, a martyr uh, type, Jim Conklin, whose initials, JC, tip us off to his identity as a Christ figure, which uh, brings me to Steinbeck, uh, who deploys this pattern of biblical imagery, this pattern of biblical typology uh, in uh, his novel, East of Eden, and to a lesser extent in The Wayward Bus, but perhaps most fully uh, in The Grapes of Wrath. The 12 members of the Jod family uh, represent, depending on your point of view or your alternative perspective, the 12 tribes of Israel uh, or the 12 apostles. We have two Toms, a John, a Noah, a Ruth, and a Rose of Sharon. Uh, Rose of Sharon's husband, Connie Rivers, figures as a kind of Judas figure. We learn as early uh, as the first or second chapter that the tractor drivers who uh, destroy the uh, houses of the uh, longtime farmers in Oklahoma earn $3 a day for that work. That is, they receive uh, the equivalent of 30 silver dimes, the equivalent of uh, 30 pieces of silver in order to tractor the people off the land. It's a, a biblical theme that is carried uh, throughout the rest of the novel. Especially um, is this detail important in uh, late in the novel when Connie Rivers decides to abandon the Jodes to return to Oklahoma to become a tractor driver because he can make $3 a day, 30 pieces of silver. He's a traitor uh, to the people. Or think of uh, the scene in which Uncle John places the box containing Rose of Sharon's stillborn child. Uh, on the, uh, the swollen stream. It's a parody of the scene in the Bible in which the baby Moses uh, escapes by floating down the Nile. Uh, or more to the point, he becomes uh, a type of John the Baptist when he screams after uh, the, uh, the apple box containing the stillborn child go down and tell them, go down in the street and rot and tell them that way. That's the way you can talk 
maybe they'll know then. On her part, uh, Ma speaks in a kind of prophetic voice, echoing the Psalms. We are the people, she declares. It's a line, frankly, that uh, concludes the 1940 movie adaptation of the novel directed by John Ford. She echoes uh, a line from the Psalms, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture. Uh, but perhaps most obviously, this pattern of biblical typology surfaces in the novel in the character of uh, the character uh, Jim Casey, the preacher Jim Casey, whose initials like Jim Cochran's uh, illustrates his importance as a kind of Jesus Christ figure. Uh, and as I've shared with my fellow panelists, I didn't realize until I was preparing uh, this uh, discussion last week that uh, the character of Jim Casey is uh, played in the movie version by John Carradine, whose initials are also JC which makes me think that maybe John Ford typecast him. <laughs> yeah, thank you, that's a joke. Um, Casey is repeatedly identified with Christ. When he's first introduced in chapter four, he tells Tom Joad, I went off alone and I sat and figured, or as we might say, uh, he was transfigured. Uh, as Tom and Casey are walking to Uncle John's home, we read that the light of the mo coming morning made his forehead seem to shine. That is, the sun illuminates. Casey's uh, forehead as though he were crowned with a halo. Uh, he's sanctified, if not deified, in such terms. When uh, Casey joins the Job family and says grace in chapter eight, he declares, I've been in the hills thinking almost, you might say, like Jesus went into the wilderness to think. I ain't saying I'm like Jesus, but I got tired like him, and I got mixed up like him, and I went into the wilderness like him. Uh, even uh, near the end of the novel, when Casey and Tom meet in the striker's tent, Casey says he's been going into the wilderness like Jesus to try to find out something. So this identification of Jim Casey with Jesus Christ is uh, punctuated repeatedly throughout the text. Casey um, had baptized Tom Joad even before the action of the novel opens in an irrigation ditch, much as Christ presumably baptized his apostles. Casey delivers a sort of Lord's Prayer uh, over the body of Grandpa when uh, they bury him. Heard a fella tell a poem one time, Casey says. And uh, he says, all that lives is holy. Got to thinking and pretty soon it means more than the words say. Or elsewhere, Casey declares that a new command, uh, 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 what's this? call what's this i call the spirit it's love i love people so much i'm fit to bust sometimes once more echoing the words of christ the new commandment i give unto you that ye love one another uh, casey goes to jail in uh, tom's place uh, in the altercation over the deputy in hooverville uh, that is, he is self-sacrificial. He is um, a type of martyr. He also preaches 
especially uh, in the strike scene later in the novel, a kind of social gospel. He organizes a strike of farm workers. And just before he is killed uh, by one of the cops who swings a pick handle and smashes his head, he says, you don't know what you're a doing. Uh, a paraphrase of the words that Christ says as he was crucified, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Well, you get the idea. Um, this pattern of biblical typology is embedded in the novel and it's not coincidental. It's been sometimes minimized, but I suspect by those who didn't go to Sunday school uh, frequently, when uh, they were children. The novel's uh, first 10 chapters correspond to the captivity of the, uh, uh, the Hebrews in Egypt. Banks, the land companies represent uh, or are the equivalent of the, the Egyptian oppressors. Like the Israelites, the Jodes are homeless and oppressed. Uh, the middle chapters, 11 through 18, represent uh, the exodus of uh, the Israelites who uh, travel to the promised land. It's worth noting, if only in passing, that uh, the Job family, like the other Okies, would have crossed the Red River, a.k.a. the Red Sea. Uh, in the panhandle of Texas. Uh, and they arrived in California in uh, chapters 19 through 30, the final 11 chapters, the figurative land of Canaan. Uh, and the Californians, of course, represent those hostile tribes the Israelites encountered upon their arrival. They uh, cross a desert before they arrive at the promised land. But in this case, it's an ironic promised land. It's a satirical land of milk and honey. Uh, I should note too, that in rereading the novel uh, for this discussion, I realized that uh, the Jodes cross the desert from needles uh, in exactly the middle of the novel. They actually look out upon the, uh, the bounty of California on exactly the middle page, at least of my edition of the novel. They arrive in a land flowing with milk and honey, but they don't share in its abundance. In fact, uh, their children starve. The Californians, AKA the Canaanites, deprive them of uh, that bounty. In fact, Tom Jode soon uh, declares, this ain't no land of milk and honey like the preachers say. They a mean thing here. They's a mean thing here. The folks here is scared of us people coming west. And so they got cops out trying to scare us back. Uh, in short, Steinbeck demythologizes the uh, myth of the New World Garden. Uh, it's not a garden. It's a, uh, it's a uh, satirical or even parodic uh, garden in which a misplaced, uh, in which the people believe in a misplaced abundance of natural resources. There may be such an abundance, but the Judds don't share in it. The Okies as a whole don't share in it. Um, let me say uh, a, a few words about the alternative endings to the novel, which also relates to this pattern of biblical typology. Um, Steinbeck could have ended the novel uh, on a sort of upbeat note with what's called the New Deal ending. 
uh, in the government camp. In fact, in the 1940 movie, the camp manager is a dead ringer for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, there, the migrants are treated humanely. There are no cops. The migrants govern themselves. They have running water, even hot water. They receive medical care. There are dances on the weekend, but there's no work. They can't build a government camp next to every cotton field or apple orchard. Steinbeck was an agrarian. Uh, my old dissertation director, Chet Isinger, Chester Isinger, wrote a piece about the Grapes of Wrath in which he highlighted the notion of Jeffersonian agrarianism uh, in the Grapes of Wrath. And I think Chet was right. Steinbeck was committed to a freehold ideal uh, in which independent yeoman farmers uh, were in, uh, uh, in which independent yeoman farmers were the basis for the uh, agricultural economy, or as Tom says at one point, we all farm our own land. There's a second possible ending, a so-called proletarian ending at the uh, point at which the uh, Casey is killed uh, trying to organize a strike. Uh, there's plenty of work to be done, but the workers are exploited and the strike ultimately is a failure. Still, um, Steinbeck might have ended the novel at this point, or as Casey tells Tom, every time they's a little step forward, we may slip back a little, but she never slips clear back. But Steinbeck was not a, a, a radical um, leftist. Uh, he was not committed to a kind of proletarian ideal, as I've already suggested. So we come to the actual ending, and I don't know exactly what to call it. Uh, the benevolent ending. It's not exactly a happy ending, but at least it uh, is an ending with uh, an optim uh, on an optimistic note. Um, recall that Tom, after Casey is bludgeoned to death, strikes the cop who killed him. Uh, much as Peter had struck the Roman soldier the night before the crucifixion in the Garden of Gethsemane. Tom is gradually converted in the course of the novel from a kind of uh, uh, indifference to a commitment to um, benevolence. Early on, he declares, I'm still laying my dogs down one at a time. But after Casey's death, he says to Ma, Casey was a good man. I can't get that picture out of my head, him laying there, head just crushed flat and oozing. Tom begins to think uh, like Casey, uh, as Casey had thought when he retired to the wilderness. When uh, Tom finally leaves the family in his final appearance in the novel in chapter 28, he uh, has been uh, converted. His conversion is complete. When Ma asks him how she will ever know whether he's dead or alive, Tom replies, it won't matter because he will be all around. And here I'll try to do my best impersonation of uh, um, Henry Fonda. I'd be everywhere, wherever you look. Wherever there's a fight so hungry people can eat, I'll be there. Wherever there's a cop beating up a guy, I'll be there. 
If Casey knowed why I'll be in the ways guys yell when they mad, and I'll be in the way kids laugh when they're hungry and when they know supper's ready. And when our folks eat the stuff they raise and live the houses they build while I'll be there. In this speech, I think, and I may be unique in suggesting this, Tom's fully identified with the apostle Thomas, uh, doubting Thomas who had doubted that Christ was resurrected and who's convinced otherwise only after Christ appears to him. Tom Jod says to Ma, I, I'm talking like Casey comes of thinking about him so much. Seems like I can see him sometimes. But while that's part of the ending, that's not the final ending. In the midst of a flood of biblical proportions, the Jodes are trapped in a boxcar where Rosa Sharon gives birth to a stillborn child. The levee that Pa Jode tries to build to hold back the water is broken. To escape the rising tide, the family flees to a barn. And there they meet a little boy and a starving father. In the last scene, Rosa Sharon offers her breast to the starving man. It's both an image of the Madonna and child, as well as Mary, the mystical rose, holding the body of the crucified Christ. Well, a final word about the symbolism of the grapes. Uh, the title, The Grapes of Wrath, is not directly uh, an allusion to the Bible, but it's the second line, uh, a second-hand allusion to the second line of Shirley Ward Howe's The Battle Hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He's trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. Uh, Steinbeck may allude to a line in Deuteronomy. The vine of the enemies of Jehovah is of the vine of Sodom and of the vines of Gomorrah. Their grapes are the grapes of Baal. Steinbeck echoes uh, Julie Ward Howe at the end of chapter 25 when he writes, in the souls of the people, the grapes of wrath are filling and growing heavy. But the last scene in which Rose of Sharon nurtures the starving man should remind us of the biblical source of her name in the Song of Solomon. I'm the Rose of Sharon and the Lily of the Valleys. She guarantees that the winter is past. Rain is over and gone, and the vine will soon put forth the tender grape. Um, this pattern of biblical typology is, I think, one of the five levels of meaning that uh, Steinbeck mentions in its letter uh, that Bob mentioned. Um, in my opinion, it goes to the heart the meaning of the text. And with that, I'll uh, close, Dick. Thank you, Gary. I think, it, I think Gary and I must have gone to the same Sunday school. Yeah. <laughs> He's seen an awful lot more that I didn't see. It's a moment of epiphany, you know, to see some things. And that's what great novels should do. Every time we read them, we should see some things maybe we hadn't before. I wonder if people who are watching today will realize the balance of the four of us. Two of you are top rated Steinbeck scholars, Bob and Susan. Gary and I are Western literary historians. So we have both the focus as well as the context and Gary's given some of that. Okay, our, our third speaker is Susan Schillinglaw. She's professor of English 
at San Jose University and the President Scholar there in 2012-13. She's also the Scholar in Residence at the National Steinbeck Center in Salinas. And for 18 years she uh, on Steinbeck, she's been most recently, she was the director of the Center for the Steinbeck Studies at San Jose State University. She has published widely on Steinbeck, most recently, Carol and John Steinbeck, Portrait of a Marriage, and On Reading the Grapes of Wrath, and as well, A Journey into Steinbeck's California. So have at it, Susan. Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you, Chris, for um, asking us to speak today. Um, I am presently uh, directing, co-directing, an a National Endowment for the Humanities Institute on Steinbeck, entitled um, John Steinbeck, Social Critic and Ecologist. And so with you know, 25 high school students, our teachers in front of me, I try to think about why Steinbeck remains a really, um, a, a, an, an author to teach and why he remains relevant and important in the 21st century. So I just gave a talk this morning, my first actually hybrid talk because I have three out with COVID who are in different parts of the country. So I tried um, hybrid and that worked pretty well. So I'm gonna try a, hybrid, a little a few hybrid, hybrid comments today about um, you know why, why read Steinbeck in 2022 as applied to the Grapes of Wrath. And so I'm gonna to try to go over quickly my points and then show a few pictures and see if that works. Um, but I think first of all, gender is important in the novel. Um, for years, you know, critics um, talked about how um, uh, Tom Joad is tutored by Casey um, to become less solipsistic and become more um, engage socially. And of course that is one of the movements in the novel. Um, Tom Jode says early on in the novel, um, when a bunch of men take you and lock you up for four years, it ought to have some meaning. Men is supposed to think things out. And he said, hey, I'd do it again. Um, do her before I could figure her out, specifically if I was drunk. So I'd hit the guy again and get put in jail. Um, that sort of senselessness kind of worries a man. So if Tom Toad starts out thinking, wow, the world doesn't make any sense, by the end, he has a purpose. So it's a kind of education of the mind and the consciousness in terms of that relationship. But when I read the book, I think it's equally important to see the kind of growth um, of Rosa Sharon through Ma and Ma's tutelage. If you read Ma's jo um, speeches to Rose throughout the book, she's really teaching rose to become a woman. But I think also in this age of, you know, um, when we're thinking about women's bodies and Roe versus Wade and the consequences of that, really the focus is on Rose of Sharon's body throughout. She's pregnant, she's, she makes love in the truck. You know, we look at her body that's, that's hot and sweaty. I mean, he makes us aware of the physicality of this woman. And she has to learn, you know, what that means, what it means to be pregnant, what it means to lose a baby. And then in this kind of radical act, I think, especially in this era, she offers her breast to a man she doesn't know, an old man, a man who's probably starving and it won't do any good anyway. She probably doesn't have any milk, but she does this radical act of sympathy and empathy and understanding. And it's wordless between Ma and Rosa Sharon at that point. So I think that's an amazing scene just for thinking about women and how it, um, that kind of education can be um, a, 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 an education of the body and the heart. So I think that balances those two kinds of ways of thinking about what we learn, um, what we can learn through suffering. Um, I also like the idea of, and I wrote about this in this little book that I that I wrote, but about emergence. You know, the celebrated chapter three about the turtle is about the turtle not only crossing the road in a very perilous fashion, but also planting seed at the end. And that whole idea of what might happen, what could happen is ever present in the book. And in some ways, this book seems to me over the years of teaching it as a kind of living organism. Um, I think Steinbeck consciously, you know, 
set it up as that because after all Tom Jode's speech is as Gary just you know quoted it whenever there's a cop beating a guy so we think about that um, when we read the book that his words come out of the text and they speak to us and I think there's so many issues in the grapes of wrath that, that it keeps turning over in our social awareness. Certainly at one point it was loss of you know, corporate farms in the Midwest and it was displacement of people and we see continued displacement now in Ukraine, it was becoming unhomed, it was, it's about migration. Um, there was just an article last week in the New York Times about Westchester farms um, becoming boutique farms during COVID and therefore farmers who wanna you know, raise goats um, no longer um, can afford to farm the land. So the Grapes of Wrath came, seems to me newly relevant all the time. And I love the way that that, that sense of emergence of Tom's, Joe's words emerging out of the text are make it kind of, and the issues of course that the uh, text addresses, make it relevant again and again. And then uh, of course, um, the idea I used to give, I used to give, um, uh, talks on Steinbeck and the common good, which seems like a perilous topic at this time. Um, but I think that uh, we still want to kind of talk about that issue of the dream and what we want and who we are. And this, of course, novel addresses the dream. Um, what is it uh, that the Jodes want? Do they want land? Do they want home? Do they want a place? Do they want stability? Do they want... Um, uh, you know, to be treated decently. So I think that whole idea of what is the American dream and what does it mean today? Um, I've been listening a lot to John Mellencamp's new album, Strictly a One-Eyed ja Jack, in part because Springsteen sings a song with him on that album, a wonderful song. And Springsteen, of course, created his own album, kind of channeling Steinbeck called A Ghost of Tom Job. But uh, he says of the dream, the um, Mellencamp says uh, in this, uh, he says sympathy that uh, at the end of the rainbow, turns out it's not somewhere. Look round, it's everywhere for anyone who cares. And I keep that keeps going over and over in my mind that the dream at the end of the rainbow, it's not a physical place. It's something different for anybody who cares. And I think Steinbeck is kind of working on the dream in that way. What can it mean for us? Um, and I think that's a subject that we can think about again and again um, as we read the book in the 21st century. Um, I have a few slides that I discovered as I was preparing for these teachers and they're just a few, but they, speak to this whole issue of relevance, I think. So I'm gonna share my screen for a minute, being inspired by this hybrid model and see if I can. I took these pictures as I was, and um, I liked what Gary said about the um, vision of California being the very center of the book. And I was going on Route 66, of course, thinking about something else I'm writing and what, what you could see as you went along the Jodes path and, um, as you, you're going through a desert, as they were going through a desert to speak to um, Gary's points. Um, and as you enter the Tehachapi Pass, um, which is celebrated there, um, you pass the Cesar Chavez Monument. And so it strikes me as this road, which is basically you're turning off Highway 66 and you're going into Bakersfield. The road itself kind of ties together some of the relevance and importance of Steinbeck's novels because Cesar Chavez um, Monument is there and Chavez and organizing the people and migrant workers in California, he was an influenced by the Grapes of Wrath. And he sought this place right off the highway of Tehachapi Pass to create um, his uh, home office and final resting place. Um, and it's called the uh, Refugio. Um, and it's a beautiful place that you can turn off right off the highway. Um, and the day I went, it was blooming with roses. So you come out from this desert and you find this garden and Cesar Chavez's legacy and a sense of hope. 
Um, it was a meeting place for Dolores Huerta and others. The National Farm Workers met there. It just seems appropriate. It's right on Tehachapi Pass. And then, of course, you, you drive over and you look for this dream, the dream of place that the Jodes so yearned for and what Gary talks about in terms of the exact middle of the novel. Um, and, you know, the Jodes are anticipating coming to California for pages of the text, like what's it going to be like, what is, and they, you know, debate what California is going to be like, and they stop right at the edge, um, the top of the Tehachapi Pass. I've always thought there should be a Jode turnout where we all look over <laughs> the um, Central Valley right at this point. But Al jammed on the brakes and stopped in the middle of the road, you know, so he's, he's stunned by it. Jesus Christ, look. And you look, of course, today you see smog, but, um, but before it used to be a, a, a little more um, dramatic scene. And you go down the hill and you can get oaky fry pies. So the legacy of Steinbeck is, is you know, multifaceted. Um, and uh, of course I had to stop and try one. Um, so you can get your uh, chicken pot savory oaky pie um, at the, uh, as you go over to Hatchapi Pass and you get another one of these vistas um, come going over the pass and it's beautiful. Uh, just as they wanted California to be, the fields spread out and you see the potential of California as a place. Um, of course, they have a long journey ahead of them. Um, and the orchards, uh, the crops, but there's also the camp that Steinbeck um, describes in The Grapes of Wrath, the kind of high point of the book where the Jodes are treated decently where other migrants are housed. And it's still a place where migrants are housed. It's open about um, seasonally. Um, and I love this flag um, on the approach to weed patch. It's all been rebuilt. There used to be a school here that was um, uh, educated um, Oki children and that's still there. This is the school rebuilt. Um, this is, so it was the Sunset School founded um, during the migration. And here's the Arvin um, migratory camp, which has also been rebuilt uh, to house uh, migrants in a place that's quite, actually quite nice. Um, so I just think that legacy um, of the Grapes of Wrath and of Stein, um, Steinbeck kind of lives on and this just this, this little, um, bubble of a California setting where, um, where Cesar Chavez legacy is celebrated, where the Arvin camps are celebrated and where the whole Vista is remains. These are the historic buildings which they have um, preserved, uh, which are the Arvin camp buildings that Steinbeck visited. Um, so they're also there. So history and the present meet and the Arvin camps. So I thought I'd show you those uh, few pictures, welcome. Um, and uh, that's my, the end of my comments about the relevance of the Grapes of Wrath today. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Now we're gonna move into the question and answer uh, part of our presentation. And some of these questions will come from people who are Zooming, some will come from us. First, uh, Bob, I think there's one for you that you can answer. It says, is the facsimile manuscript available for sale anywhere? The one that you showed us. You said uh, yes, there were a thousand it, copies. It, it is. Um, I think you'd have to, I think you would just have to Google uh, facsimile manuscript. Um, it's a French company. Um, and it would probably, the, mail, the mailing address would probably come up. It's, um, uh, I, they, the people who put the book together sent this to me as a, a complimentary copy. So I, I could, I didn't order it myself. So, but I think if you Googled it, you could probably find a, find a outlet that would sell it. Okay. Okay. Um, now, uh, next one is a question I, I'd like to hear your answer. And I'll give you an example of what I would answer this question with and then ask each of you. What is the outstanding quality of this novel? And I'm a historian. And I think that historians should learn from a novel like this 
the power of a good story because we tend to write uh, monographs with lots of footnotes and we forget that our, our books should be storytelling power. For me, Grapes of Wrath, it's a novel that has wonderful story par- uh, telling power and it draws, I think, both the specific and the general reader. So answering that question, what's the outstanding quality? It would be storytelling power for me. What would the rest of you say? Yeah, I, I would certainly agree with that. Yeah, um, uh, Steinbeck worked hard to give that story a, an enormous impact. Um, and he did it in an interesting way. I didn't mention this earlier, but you know, if you think about the road narrative as centrally being one that in particularly in 19th century American literature paired to a white, white character and a non-white character, you know, Ishmael and Queequeg or however you want to think about it. They have their journey and they have their experiences and so on. Steinbeck rewrote that script. And I've said this many times, Tom Joad is an outlaw. He's a released, just released from pr- prison. He goes to California with his mother. I mean, there's no other 19th century, you know, a novel with that kind of armature that's quite the same. So he li- he's linking two vital stories, the story of the individual and the story, as Susan said so well, the story of the family. And I think that one of Simon's one of Simon's great, great um, um, uh, subjects was the notion of a family. All of his novels yeah. speak have characters who, who are seeking home, whether that home is, uh, you know, the nuclear family or whether it's something else. They're all seeking home. That's part of that American dream that, that Susan mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, those are those are powerful and resonant, um, uh, you know, indicators. I think, and they they all play into that notion of story. It was, he said he was trying to write history as it was being made. So there's a kind of contemporaneousness to the Grapes of Wrath. But on top of that, if you, you know, you couldn't, it's not history alone because you, 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 couldn't, you couldn't legislate having um, women go around giving their breasts to, to dying men as a social uh, uh, answer for, for the problems of homelessness or whatever. It has to be at that moment a fiction. It's made up. It draws on its resonances in terms of the Bible, whatever it might be, or in terms of the uh, iconography of Western painting, which use that, uses that symbol of the, the woman giving a breast to, to a dying person. Um, and that's what makes it story. That's what makes it, puts it into that level of affect, I think, or emotion, or it tugs at us in ways that we can't, it haunts us in ways that we simply cannot get past. And that is what I think as Susan so aptly said, gives us that sense of uh, immediacy with the Grapes of Wrath. It's our book, even yeah. though it's yeah. 400 years old. I'm, I'm yeah. just kidding. Yeah. But, yeah. Well. And uh, no turtles in history either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Gary and Susan, what would you say is the outstanding quality? Um, I would say I love the language of the book. And I think it's... Um, the speeches of the various characters. It's great to listen to this book, Um, a wonderful recording by Penguin. So I think it's a book to be heard and relished and he wanted it to be slow and deliberate. And I think, you know, it's a good book to listen to if you're on a road trip as one of my participants did, but um, on the way to California. Uh, So I, I just think it's got, really powerful language. He put his heart and soul into it. And that's apparent in the, the purity of the language. Gary, what do you think? Well, um, let me speak um, not as a historian, Dick. Do you hear me? <laughs> uh, let me let me speak personally. Um, I agree with what both Bob and Susan have said. I think it's a rhapsodic book in many respects. Um, My grandfather lost his job as a machinist in Wichita, Kansas, early in the depression. 
he scraped together all the money he could <coughs> and he bought a farm and moved his family to Oklahoma. Oh. <laughs> well, it wasn't uh, a happy uh, depression. I could go into detail, but you can imagine uh, the deprivation my father and his family suffered uh, as a newly arrived Oki. They never escaped to, uh, to California. The first time I read The Grapes of Wrath, I think I was probably 25. I knew the family history, my family history. Uh, I wept uh, when I read the final chapter. It's the last time uh, I've ever wept uh, in reading a novel. It uh, spoke to me in ways I could not have imagined. It helped explain my own family history in a way I could not have imagined. And so, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to extrapolate from that any argument uh, for the novel's greatness, although I think it is a great novel, except to say that, uh, yeah, it made me weep. Uh, weep. I'm a specialist on what people say about the American West, both in fiction and, and in history. Think about 1939. This novel comes out and it's a bestseller and we know that it uh, it won a Pulitzer, and in 1962, when he wins the Nobel Prize, the, the judges say a lot about this novel. Do you know what also came out in 1939? Stagecoach, the famous movie, which was also directed by John Ford, and next year, 1940, he did the film for, the, for this novel. The 1939 Stagecoach has... Uh, John Wayne in it. Here's, here's John Wayne winning all of this interest. That film is sort of the runner up for the movie of the year. Uh, and here is Grapes of Wrath coming out in the same year, have tremendously different points of view about the American West. How do you explain 1939, one being a kind of awkward, backward looking, rather romantic, another one being very much social commentary and Today, the present, which do you think has won out in our depictions of the West? <laughs> I'll, de I'll defer to Susan. <laughs> okay, Susan. <laughs> Gary's saying you're going to answer it, Susan. <laughs> I think we have them both. You know, I, I think we want the West as it was, and we have forced to look at the West as it is, you know? I, I talked about um, just briefly this morning, homelessness and, you know, San Francisco, we're, ah, what are we doing? Um, versus the dream of the possibility of say, Arvin Camp, you know, I'm in so many different ways you could talk about. I think we, I think we want it both ways. We want to have that dream or what was, or the West of the nostalgia um, yeah. and yeah. the West of, that we live in. You know, I think sometimes we are so fixated on either or, we have forgotten about both and. Both and, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Absolutely and both right. and is, is yeah. Susan's answer, I think, yeah. yeah absolutely right. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, I've just written a little essay called Aiming for the Middle. Uh, I'm, following, <laughs> I'm following Wallace Stigner when he says that after a lot of thinking, of both what's on the left, which he calls radical, and what's on the right reactionary, he is sort of aiming toward the middle. But you, you know, uh, many of us don't like to say middle of the road because we're then sort of uh, accused of being waffling, that we can't do, we can't make a decision. Stegner was saying the complexity of the middle is more demanding and thoughtful than way off to the left or way yeah. off to the right. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are politicians maybe need to think about that? I don't know, maybe they, <laughs> maybe they should. Um, a qu another question for you. Does this novel deserve the Pulitzer Prize? 
the best thing we can give in 1939 40 is the, that award. Does it deserve that? Looking back and knowing what you know now and knowing what other novels have been awarded that highbrow prize, what do you think? Well, let me uh, jump in, of course. Um, what other novel from 1939 deserves it more? I can't think of one, and I'm pretty knowledgeable about 20th century American fiction. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, uh, you probably have read the same as I. Uh, Steinbeck seemed to be worried, and you Steinbeck scholars could tell me whether I'm off track on this. He seemed to be worried about whether he can compete with Hemingway to be at the top. And I, I don't know enough, but certainly uh, Hemingway had made his name by that 1930. You know, Hemingway made his reputation and where he's at the top because he wrote about my Basque relatives. That's that's what put Hemingway at the top, right? <laughs> right, right, Gary? <laughs> Bologna? <laughs> yeah. You know, what I, you know what I always say about the Grapes of Wrath in terms of reading it? What other book since then has gotten the whole country enraged, you know, responding, reading, banning, whatever? I mean, you know, not that many books create that, you know, that, that sense of a national uh, discussion that Grapes of Wrath did. Maybe Rachel Carson, um, but I always ask my students this and they say Harry Potter. Not quite the same thing. Um, wow. <laughs> but uh, so I think, yeah, it deserved, it deserved the poll. I don't too. know if you saw the same poll I did, and I, I don't know whether this poll speaks for all, very many people, but a poll recently was taken asking what's the most important American novel of the last 150 years? To Kill a Mockingbird was the yeah, one that was that. chosen for, for that in that poll. Would you rank this novel above that since that poll? said that, that To Kill a Mockingbird was the most important. Would you put Grapes of Wrath above that? The same or what? I would. Uh, and I think those polls change, you know, from decade to get decade. Yes. There were a number of polls that were done in the 1990s and into the 2000s. And the Grapes of Wrath came out uh, either number one or in the top three um, in, in every one of them. Um, and I know I, I, I heard vaguely about this one about To Kill a Mockingbird. That, that's a worthy book. There's no question about it. And I think it has significance in that regard. But I, I don't know. To my mind, uh, The Grapes of Wrath is, you know, as I said before, one of the great, you know, novel achievements of American literary history. I, I don't know. I mean, it, you know, when you think about the four or five <laughs> hottest subjects of our time, I think probably we would agree on three or four of them probably, dealings with race and ethnicity. Now, th this week and last week, yeah. questions over abortion, things yeah. over environment. Yeah. Then if you think about, yeah. uh, say, Black Lives Matter being one of the hot subjects, that's going to bring on To Kill a Mockingbird a great deal because that's at the center of that novel. If we think about questions of immigration, both within the country and from outside the country, that's going to bring on more grapes of wrath when you think about that. Next week, we may have another hot subject. Maybe <laughs> it has to do with guns. And maybe some books will be issued back on the scene because they deal with that subject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's, um, uh, uh, yeah, I think, I, think that's, I think that's right. I think that's right. Uh, I can't remember. I was going with somewhere with that, but I, I lost it. <laughs> I plead. I, uh, I plead I'm with you. Age, I'm with you, Bob. Age old abilities. Yeah. <laughs> when, when um, I get, go ahead, Gary. Yeah, let me jump in here. Um, I would rank Grapes of Wrath far higher uh, than To Kill a Mockingbird. I think uh, Harper Lee's story of Tom Robinson is. Uh, a cheat. Uh, he's an attractive, uh, uh, articulate, um, intelligent black man who's falsely accused. Well, what would that story be if he was none of those things? Uh, so she hedges. I think The Grapes of Wrath, for my money, is a far greater novel. 
having said that, let me add that I still harbor a, a prejudice for Adventures of Huckleberry Finn as the great novel of the last 150 years. Let me segue from that to uh, a comment for Susan, who talked about the oaky pie. I don't know if uh, I don't know if you want to register this or not, Susan. But I read recently that, at least until recently, the only radio stations that carried the University of Oklahoma Sooner football games. Uh, were located in uh, California, either Stockton or Bakersfield. Oh, really? <laughs> 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 yeah, Bakersfield had a they had a um, conference on the grapes grapes of wrath and Steinbeck a few years ago. They they really you know celebrated. They're proud of you know that legacy. Okay, so, we got uh, we have. Uh, some more questions. Um, okay, here's an, an add-on to what Bob said. The publisher that Dr. DeMott referenced for a facsimile manuscript is one that I recently purchased a similar book of the Jane Eyre manuscript, and it's beautiful. The company is SP Books. Yes, that's so right. Somebody wanted to uh, go on to that. Let's see here. Uh, here's Jim. I don't have a question, but I'm really impressed that Steinbeck wrote this novel longhand. How did that impact the story? That is, if he had a word processor, heaven forbid, uh, with all of its modern editing and cut and paste capabilities available, would the Grapes of Wrath have turned out any different? We can only speculate. What <laughs> would, would you speculate? You know, uh, I was reading, he said, what do you take for this? that it's my wife who wrote her version of Grapes of Wrath and that it's a better version than what I wrote. Is he just malarking or what, did Steinbeck believe what he said? Uh, hmm. Well, he, he couldn't have done it without her. There's no question about it. So, you know, um, and he, he makes that very clear right at the, in the dedication of the, of the book, but you know, I think uh, that's a good question, though, because it goes back to that, the compression of the manuscript, I think, which I think gave him, uh, I think one of the, the, there's a whole interior dimension about Steinbeck's writing, I think, that we sometimes overlook. And I think that compression of the, of the manuscript gave him a sense of, A, immediacy to the material that he was writing about, but it was also a part of that slow handedness. I mean, he wanted to, he, there's a sense in which he he tasted and weighed every word before it went down, and one of the one of the uh, proofs of that I think is that in that entire two hundred thousand plus word autograph handwritten manuscript, there are very 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 few crossouts. There is only one place where he added maybe a half a page of material to catch up what had happened earlier, and that's it. I mean, it's just one of the most remarkable, um, clear-handed uh, um, uh, narrative uh, productions you could ever imagine. I can't imagine, I, I guess I can't imagine that having had, a, if he had had a Ford processor, it would have been any better. I, I don't know. I mean, these are, these are questions we can't answer, but right. to me, it's a remarkable piece of artistic in, uh, integrated artistic effort. <laughs> it's really, really amazing. Oh, anyway. We can have opinions even if we don't answer, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> well, let, Jerry, go let, ahead. yeah, let me say I'm glad it was not written on a word processor because at least we have a manuscript that yeah, people right. like me can um, right. examine right. and analyze and discuss. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And you know, also the the manuscript starts out with you know, new start, big writing, because he wants to write large enough so that his wife Carol can read it, because she's going to be typing it. And then he gets 
you know, as he gets going, his writing gets tinier and smaller and smaller and smaller. He fits more and more words on the page. I think that he was aware that if he got into what he called a work dream, like if he was really absolutely, you know, one with the text uh, so that he kind of forgot time and place, that that was his most effective writing. And he could look back on the day's yeah. writing and say, wow, I was there that day. You know, I, I did this, you know, incredible completely illegible writing to anything, anyone but Carol. But he packed twice as many words on a page in the middle of the manuscript as at the beginning. So I, I think, yeah, the manuscript is important. We got time for a couple more. Uh, here's one that the U2 Sp Steinbeck specialists can answer probably. Who were the people Steinbeck <clears throat> was reading at this time? Say from the late, in the late thirties. I don't know the answer to that question. Well, I, I mean, I think there were people who formed his notion of what it was he was going to do. I keep coming back to Uncle Tom's Cabin. I think that had a yeah, yeah. fairly significant yeah. impact because of he, you think about what Stowe did there. She, she keeps addressing the reader and says, I want to make you feel, you know, what, what it is I'm, I'm doing. That, 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 that uh, sort of dithrambic emotional register is very much in The Grapes of Wrath. But also there's that sense that Steinbeck left out a lot of people in the Grapes of Wrath, and you know that's been he's been attacked for that because there there aren't enough people of color in it. But he but like Stowe, he realized that looking that considering this situation from the point of view of white farmers was going to have much more resonance for the audience than it would be if he had you know various other ethnic backgrounds uh, being represented as well. So he was he was kind of hedging his bets there in certain ways and, and selecting it. But I would say, I would say certainly that uh, Stowe was, was behind it. I don't think he had read Melville by that time. That came later, had more influence on East of Eden. Um, the Jungle was another one that he certainly uh, had, had knew about, had read. Um, and I probably had read Frank Norris, The Octopus. I mean, those were all books that were part of the, you know, the California landscape, so to speak, literary landscape anyway. But he also read, um, I don't think there's enough been made of this. I mean, Steinbeck tended not to read in the direction of the contemporary um, modernist novelist, the way Hemingway and Faulkner did, but he had a tendency to look backwards and he loved Greek and Roman classics. Herodotus was one of his favorite writers and Thucydides. They all wrestled with issues of the contemporaneousness of history and the notion of story, that is making up what they couldn't see or verify by sight or personal experience they made up, or they, they passed on stories of hearsay. And I think th those people had an enormous influence on, on Steinbeck's life, kind of mindset as a, as a, beginning, as a beginning writer. So, anyway. Very good. He was so, not, I, no, I don't think, I, he, Steinbeck was, the whole Steinbeck Hemingway thing is is complicated, but Steinbeck uh, Hemingway disparaged Steinbeck on a number of occasions, and Hemingway never did that to Heming uh, to I mean sorry Steinbeck never did that to Hemingway. He was always respectful of Hemingway's work. He thought he was a great writer, um, but it didn't work the other way. Hemingway had a tendency to you know as you all know to attack people who, for whatever reason. You know, but. As especially as he got older. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, do we have a close-up question here? Uh, my close-up question is: This book also got negative reactions, and it's as late as the 1990s, where it's been kept out of libraries and castigated by conservative people. Do you have any basis for thinking that? There should be any criticism of this, negative criticism of this novel? Or is that just people, readers, bringing their point of view so uh, arduously that they can't see the strengths of the novel? No, they're all oh. wrong. <laughs> Go ahead, Gary. I'm, I'm sorry, Bob, what'd you say? I said they're all wrong. <laughs> well, um, I would echo that point. Um, before I retired, I routinely taught a course entitled Banned American Books. Oh, man. And I, taught, I, I suggested the alternative title for that course would be Great American Books. 
um, Leaves of Grass, Huck Finn, uh, Lolita, uh, The Grapes of Wrath, To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, Catcher in the Rye. It was a wonderful course. But of uh, the point I would make that uh, is that uh, great books are disparaged for no good reason. Uh, if I was still teaching, I'd still teach that course. I might even have to add a few extra books to it. <laughs> uh, all of which is to say, yeah, Bob's right. They're wrong. <laughs> Susan, well, you agree with I mean, I think that books can make us feel uncomfortable. And so, um, you know, it can make us feel uncomfortable to look at the parts of ourselves we don't particularly like or might want to ban. Um, but it's probably a good thing if we do that, <laughs> both psychologically and with our reading. So I think sometimes, um, you know, books that make us feel uncomfortable about you know, issues of gender or class or race or um, violence um, that we want to just shove to the side. But of course, I'm a professor, a teacher, but I don't think we should shove, shove them aside, but they should be front and center because we should talk about the issues that make us uncomfortable. If we don't talk about the issues that make us uncomfortable, we just keep pushing them aside and we never, we never confront them. So when, when Susan says, but I'm a professor, does that mean we've all been woke is that what the problem was? <laughs> I, I heard an interesting definition of a professor yesterday. Someone who talks while people sleep. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to do a little closing here and then I'm going to come back to each of you for your two minutes or to wrap up. Uh, so think about what you're going to say. In the closing, of course, we like to thank people for, for uh, listening. And, and whether they were sleeping or not, Gary, we were talking and providing good stuff. Uh, and if people are interested in uh, getting what we've been talking about today, these are all recorded. And let me remind you that also that uh, we can uh, get uh, things from the recording that I mentioned to you earlier. And uh, that would be again to, with this uh, address. And that is Randall, R-A-N-D-A-L-L, -L, at nas.org. And if you send a question that we didn't get to, send it into that email address, and then they'll send it on to us. So it's uh, nice to have people with us. And now we'll go to each person. We'll go in the same order we did. So Bob, you start us out, and Susan will close out. Yeah, no, listen, I think, um, you know, I think we need this book more than ever. I mean, you look around at the news these days, it's so depressing and the, the, the rise of anti-intellectualism, the rise of the, the distrust of science, the rise of common good sense is appalling. I mean, it's, I've never seen it worse than it is right now. Um, and I think this book, you know, is an antidote to that. And I, <clears throat> There's a wonderful quotation. Um, Susan mentioned Brink, Bruce Springsteen earlier, uh, who actually she she won't she's too modest to tell you, but she actually knows him, <laughs> and has had some wonderful dealings with him. He and and Elaine Steinbeck as well. But he has a wonderful comment. And he was talking at one time about uh, why Steinbeck is important. And he said, you know, you read Steinbeck, and he said, you know, like in the Grapes of Wrath, he said, quote. That's Steinbeck hanging his ass out there for us, unquote. <laughs> and you know, and and so in, in hanging his out ass out there for us, he's he's doing us a service. So the book itself, whether you see it as sentimental or whether you see it as communistic, which was of course not true, but or too much in the way of social socialism, but whatever, whatever. Uh, it's Steinbeck hanging his out ass out there and doing something that we would call cultural work, you know, for us. So. You know, yeah. Bless God, bless Steinbeck. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gary, what do you think? <clears throat> well, let me uh, once again echo Bob. Um, it is Steinbeck hanging his ass out there, and and good for him. Um, if there are any teachers out there listening, 
uh, I began uh, my discussion uh, of this novel when I was teaching with the question, who are the criminals in the novel? Well, um, Tom Joe's been convicted and sentenced, but is he the worst criminal? Of course not. There are plenty of other criminals. There are plenty of other uh, types who cross the line, who violate rights, who are guilty of complicity in uh, oppression of the migrants. That's a place to begin. Um, but let me uh, let me close here. Uh, I've been a uh, a Fulbrighter in in Germany several times, and I still remember a, a story told me twenty five years ago. Uh, John Ford's movie adaptation of The Grapes of Wrath opened in the uh, Palast Theater in Berlin in 1940 during uh, the <clears throat> Third Reich. And it was soon withdrawn because the German audiences went to see it and discovered that even the poorest farmers in the U.S. could afford to buy their own cars. Uh, it's a great novel. It's a great American novel. Uh, and it speaks to, as we've already said, uh, the hopefulness of a better uh, a future, even for the most downtrodden of us. Susan? I think, you know, I was, as I was, again, preparing for this um, Steinbeck Institute and looking over notes and such, I ran into a review that of Frank Riches about the musical Oklahoma, which he said he'd first looked at it, this kind of classic American musical and positive, and then this, the new, there's a night, the, I think the Broadway um, a version a few years ago, said really emphasized the darkness of Judd and what that story says about the musical. It's not just celebrating, but there's darkness there. And I, I think he says, um, built into the show, as it been built into America, the conflicts between white American majority and the other, whether the other is defined by race, immigrant origins, class, or sexuality. And I think that the Grapes of Wrath is really about the other. Um, the other at the time happened to be Okies and what that story is all about. So I think it's a powerful story that um, just, that's why the book keeps um, being relevant and important um, that we're looking at how the other lives. And so that's, that's what I, I think I, the reason I, I really love and appreciate this novel. Okay, thumbs up to the three of you. And before you leave, if there's time, you might want to check in the chat section and see some of the comments that people have sent in. Uh, and there are only two or three questions that we didn't get to, and those probably will come to us. So thanks very much. I appreciate, appreciate very much. And I hope that you will support the National Association for Scholars when you get an opportunity. I think they're doing a very good job. And I like very much this series. Great American novel, may it go on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dick. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Richard. Thank you all. Yeah. I'll follow up with an email afterwards with the recording and uh, same with everybody listening in. Bye now.